This week on Time Trumpet, the war on terror. <laughs> one of those terrors came around my way, I'd smack him when I'd show him. The day the BBC realised some of its presenters were old and past it. Last night, Conservative peers blocked plans to end the automatic right to trial by jury and proposals for foundation hospitals. We visit Tim Henman at his new cafe. Would you like a slice of cake with your coffee? And we remember Scylla Black's live autopsy. There we are. I'll just hand you that, Karen. It's 2031, and with the opening of the new Atlantic footbridge, we have the ability to walk freely wherever we want. We can take food in convenient pill form, so that all we need eat are pill meals. But life was so different 30 years ago. Children under 10 are getting fatter, with new figures out today showing there's been a sharp rise in the number of obese children in England. Our health correspondent, Jill Higgins, reports. This is the age group seeing the biggest rise in obesity. It's increasing the children's risk of heart disease and diabetes. Today's message is that weights must come down. But if the problems are so obvious, why are they proving so difficult to tackle? It's easy to claim that my product doesn't make a difference, my advertising isn't making a difference, my school meals aren't making a difference. Um, so I think the blame has to be shared. But we really all do have to take responsibility for creating a world where our kids are being damaged. I saw a kid once, he was so fat, you couldn't see his eyes. <laughs> his mouth was like a tube. One man concerned with children's eating habits was, of course... Jamie Oliver. Kids, how'd you fancy a bit of Jamie Oliver for your dinner tonight? Jamie Oliver cloned himself and made himself into little mounds of, of Jamie Oliver flesh. So that was what you cooked. I've got this uh, product. It's called Jamie Oliver's Cuts. It's my own cloned flesh made from my own body. And it talks, right? So it says to you things like, uh, it says, pick me up. It says, uh, you know, tenderise me. Put it in the frying pan, stick a bit of salt on, you do what it says, and there you are. Break that opening, give it a little bit of a twang. And I just want about two tablespoons of vegetable. You, know, you could have a bit of camaraderie with the ingredients, and it was sort of nice. It, it made it a much more human process. Or, you know, have you gone off or are you all right for a couple of days? No, I'm all right, you know. It was always very jolly. Bit of chilli powder. <coughs> it does get up my old nose, though. I mean, it's quite a startling idea, this whole cloning yeah, yeah, flesh. Yeah. How did you arrive at that? Yeah, well, um, it was after the bird flu thing. Somebody told me that human flesh tasted a bit like chicken, you know? So uh, I cut a toe off and uh, fried up the little parsley, and uh, it was lovely. Jules loved it. Uh, and we took it from there, really, you know, found a few scientists, teamed up with them, and it all kicked off. Yeah, do you, do you miss your toe? No. Oh. No, 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 I climbed another one from the other foot. I've got nice sort of fat marblings. All that fat's going to kind of, like, melt and kind of make me really, really tasty. If I want a piece of meat... That, that's going to talk back to me. I'll just go and find myself a man, won't I? Girls, eh? <laughs> you like, love you, Jamie Oliver, don't you? Now make sure. Yeah, well, I bought some that. Jimmy Oliver meat, mm. which I thought was the same thing, but it turned out to be like a cheaper version. And it just said things like lovely Jubilee and puker. How did you feel when Gordon Ramsay brought out uh, processed Ramsay <laughs> flesh that swore? I had one of his gourmet sausages the other day. It came back up and swore at me. Said, chew me properly, you fat twat. A little bit of mustard on me. Cooked in Coca Cola. Fuck all else. Do me a favour. Fuck off. Go on. I mean, I'm sorry, but who wants a cutlet that shouts out your mother's a cocksucker? Yeah. Right? Do you remember some of the documentaries at the time? Oh, yes. Uh, the Girl with the Voice of Boris Johnson. Bueno, María, si quisieras uh, decir unas palabras para las cámaras. My appreciation of Pericles is very much a, a romantic and literary one. There is no cure for María. It isn't fatal, but I doubt she'll make it to 30. Beware. There's a Laura, Laura blood. I root around and examine dear old Scylla. Do you remember Scylla Black's autopsy? 
Yeah, Scylla Black, that was a brilliant one. But um, some of the other ones, like Anthea Turner's, that was a bit of a flop. Oh. Surprise, surprise. It's an ovarian cyst. Hey, but do you know apparently she was a singer? No, mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, they didn't know till, till they opened her up. In 1964, uh, Scylla Black had a hit with um, anyone who had a heart. And anyone who's ever seen a heart would recognise the telltale signs of atherosclerosis. It's here. And also here. What did you enjoy most in the years 2005? Six, two thousand seven, eight, and nine. I guess what I most enjoyed in the year two thousand five to nine was the war on terror. Today, in twenty thirty one, we've got so used to thirty years of terror that some of it no longer scares us. Hang on. But at the time, people were genuinely scared. Now and again, you think, oh, this bloody terror, you know, oh, this, this, all this terror, you know, and you often, you often hear people say that, you know, you say, how are you doing? And, all right, apart from all this, this terror, this wretched terror. And they had every right to be scared. The war on terror was one the government was losing. This policeman should have arrested this suicide bomber instead of giving him directions to Buckingham Palace. And though we'd eliminated the threat of the enemy flying planes into buildings, no one was prepared for terrorists flying two buildings into the sides of planes. No one was killed, but a lot of people were surprised. But 30 years ago, Tony Blair and then Gordon Brown got through no fewer than 24 home secretaries in trying to combat terror. Between them, they tried to come up with as much legislation as possible to stop terror. We banned rucksacks, but it had, it had very little effect, so we had to go further and ban buses and trains. That only had a limited effect, so we decided in the end to ban all forms of transport. So people would walk from city to city, but as we had already banned rucksacks, they couldn't bring any supplies and a lot of people died from dehydration. Well, we actually asked um, TV and, and radio programmes to include bomb threat um, plots within their storylines. They had a, a dirty bomb go off in Balamori. People never forgot that, never. We got a lot of people in. We got movers and shakers from the entertainment industry. We got Richard Curtis in to do a special uh, Vicar of Dibley sketch with Dawn French and, and uh, that idiot blonde woman who kept asking Dawn... Um, does Allah approve of uh, bombing and bombers? Well, the joke was meant to be that in a West Country accent it came out like bumming and bummers. There have been more angry protests in Muslim countries. Here, several hundred protesters marched through central London. These were waiting for worshippers when they arrived at the mosque in Regent's Park in London for the midday prayer. Many people didn't like them. The mosque's own security people were also unhappy and made them take the placards out onto the street. I remember people started saying um, things about Muslims, like, oh, Muslims are very nice, aren't they? People would often drop that into conversation just in case anyone was listening who might... Mm. You know, and you'd, hear, you'd have all sorts of non sexuals people would say, um, that's £1.70, please, and um, I like Muslims. Good morning. Imagine yourself heaven. heaven. Commentators at the time argued that Islam it's easy if try. was radicalised by the actions of this man who invaded no help below us. Iraq. Above us, only sky. I'd like to end Guantanamo. But he didn't. And 30 years on, Guantanamo Bay still exists. A whole city has developed with shops and schools for the inmates' children. Everyone's still bombarded day and night with white noise and the phrase, you are nothing. You, you're nothing. But there are now luxuries allowed, like mobile phones. You are nothing. You are nothing. So bad it's good, that was the, the sort of catchphrase, I think. You're nothing. Other inmates work here professionally, and some have even gone into the army. You are nothing. You 
for nothing. Guantanamo you even has its own nothing. TV station you pumping out its nothing. biggest variety hit, Guantanamo Madhouse. You are nothing. A number of Iraqis went on record saying this is like the Isle of Man now. Stop this. Imagine all the people living for today. The color girl city. Take a walk on the wild side. One, two, three, four. Maria, si quisieras hablar, por favor. Thatcher was the last person that I can remember who said that anything that seemed to sound like a lesson about what she thought society should be like. Gracias. Maybe we should uh, have a think about some of the things from the years 2005, 2006, sure. 2007. Sure. Uh, not finished. 2007, 2008, that we all remember. OK. Um, uh, monkeys. Biscuits. Bricks. Exit signs. Ovens. I'll just put it in the oven. Oh, ricochet boys. The Swedish. Mercy killing. What was all that about? Wool. Torture. Good. You can't just say good. OK, uh, what do you mean to do? Just individual words that sum up 2005 to about... That's two difficult. Um, even the word football is foot... And ball, I cannot. Uh, no, but go. it's a composite word. Okay, can Do I use you... composite? Is okay. Yes. Okay, composite is okay. Football. Yes. Mm, mother care. Motor car. M mother care. Mother care. Mother care. I I was a child. My mother was taking care of me. All oh, right. That's. But you don't mean the firm mother care. Oh no. No. No 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 no. I mean my mother was carrying me. You see. I'm sorry to pick you up on this, but if you meant the firm mother care, then that would be a valid use of the word mother care because mother care would therefore be a composite word. But if you were talking about the care of your mother, then that's really two words, mother and care. OK. I understand, I understand, yeah. I understand. Sorry, I just... Yeah. Uh, OK, no, mother care is not possible, no? No. Um, single mum? No. My father wasn't there. Two of our greatest sportsmen from that period were Tim Henman and Andy Murray. 30 years on, I caught up with just Tim Henman, who talked to us about Andy Murray. I had announced that yeah. I was going to retire at the end of the season. That must be my last Wimbledon, mm -hmm. my last chance. But Andy beat me in round one, mm -hmm. straight sets. And of course, I was bitterly disappointed. But... Uh, the form he was in, he was obviously going to go on and win it. So I jumped over the net to, to hug him, and I must have touched something because um, my foot got stuck and I broke my racket, I slipped, broke my racket, and speared him straight through the neck. People couldn't have been angrier if he'd taken a shit in his hand and served it as a volley at the Royal Box. They were angry. They were furious. And people would come up to me and say, Murderer. And ruined everything. That must have got you down, really, over a period of time. Oh, well, uh, yes, it did. It did get me down. And I got into the car mm -hmm. in the garage with the engine running. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was passed out with the fumes. And so I must have accidentally slipped onto the uh, gear stick mm. and put it into reverse. So the car went backwards out into the road and I killed another man. What then? What was going through your mind? <laughs> well, what happens when you even fail to kill yourself? Where do you go then? Rural Hertfordshire, that's where. Everything all right? And it's in rural Hertfordshire that Tim Henman has opened up his new cafe, Tiger Tim's. I tried my hand at commentating, but the BBC replaced me with Goran Ivanisevich who almost sounded incomprehensible and made remarks about ugly women and faggots. Come on, Edmund! Go on, Tiger! What's that? Oh, um, I fitted that just for a laugh. I seem to amuse some of the punters. What's that noise? Oh, that's a disabled toilet. 
I had to sack the bar manager, and he did that before he left. I don't know how to change it. One Queen's Club sandwich and a Timochino. Uh, I put up a blackboard saying I serve the 12th fastest service in the world. Uh, but when I'm slow getting coffee, they all shout, Come on, Tim! Any other little improvements you've done? I have installed free internet. But we uh, have tramps coming in here, fiddling with themselves. I wouldn't mind if they drank my coffee, but they drink dental mouthwash. Do you want me to do the clenched fist? No, 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 don't do that, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> what didn't you like about that period? Um, and, and can you make it five words? Mm, OK, that's an easy one. Um, I didn't like many things. Do you remember the news? Yeah, I do, actually. What happened to it that? It was just mental. Every day, oh, this happened. You ought to, this happened. It's like, all right, I've got a life. The fireworks have started. At that time, so few people watched the news that broadcasters tried everything they could to broaden its appeal. For example, getting Claire Balding to commentate on the bombing of Iran. Shudders right through you and the light. The colours there of white and fuchsia. Very regal and very loud. They fall down like, like gold, like gold stars dropping from the sky. The sky lit up, the faces around lighting up. Building up now to the big finale. Which is going to be a burst of happy colours. And coming up later in the programme... Six months after a tornado ripped through Birmingham, many homes, this whole street, are still completely uninhabitable. Later, I'll be asking why. And I'll be reporting from Drumlanrig Castle in Dumfries and Galloway, the scene of a multi-million pound art raid. And I'll be strapping myself up with Semtex and asking the question, just how effective are the defences at Sizewell B? And I'll be getting this prop ready for Evan Davis's report on house prices. And I'll be here to supply the studio guests with teas and coffees and generally make sure they're well looked after. And I'll be asking the Chancellor... To win over declining viewers to the news, the BBC pumped billions into coming up with a more exciting news service. Some of the broadcasts consisted entirely of explanations of what was coming up next. And I'll be trying on all the reporters' suits to check them for wear and tear. Good night. The bulk of the £200 billion spent on revamping the news was used on giving Hugh Edwards a hydraulic desk to appeal to young people. I remember the first time I saw that, I thought the cameraman was moving up, but it wasn't, the desk was going down. Right. It's like when you're um, on a train, you're looking out the train window, and you think, oh my God, my chair's moving. But it's not, it's that the whole train is moving. Of course it didn't mean that they got any more viewers. People would just switch on at the end to see the desk go down. So then they had the desk rise up at the start, but it just meant people would switch on at the start, switch off during the middle, and switch on at the end again to see the desk go down. So then they installed a randomizer so that the desk would go up at unexpected points throughout the show. But in the end, Hugh Edwards just said, you know, I'm not a fairground ride. With viewers snubbing Hugh Edwards and his desk in droves, the BBC just gave up. Hello, very good morning. You're watching BBC News 24 with Joanna Gosling and Simon McCoy. It's just after half past 11. A summary of the news now. What the public did watch in their millions was BBC One's People Who Act Like Their Name Would Imply They Would. This week on People Who Act Like Their Name Would Imply They Would, meet Carrie, Sherry, Nick, Josh and Ernest. There was one with a guy called Sean who'd shaved all his body hair off. By the end of the series they were getting really desperate. There was a guy called Bill who drafted bills. He wasn't actually an MP, he just did it in his shed. Wayne. Jon Snow, they cut out in the end because he didn't... He did, he, they realised... The one bit of the Channel 4 news he doesn't do is the weather. The, the weather. It's frustrating because we, we filmed a lot of stuff talking about Jon Snow and then some bright spark piped up about, yeah. well, this doesn't actually work, yeah. Um, oh, Liam Piano, who was that pianist. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah, Otherwise yeah, he wouldn't yeah. have been in the show. 
Oh, there was a classic one with this guy. Uh, he, I can't remember his name, but it was very funny because his name actually it doesn't matter because his name described what he did. Um, oh God, I'm an idiot. It was very good though. You have no recollection of his name. No, his name dis his name described the thing he did. No, I know that. Mm. You can't remember anything he did. No. Oh, God, it was really funny, because... What, what was funny about it? Can you remember anything that was funny about it? How close the two things were, like his name and the thing he did, were so close that it was very funny. And you have no recollection of his name or what he did? No. Andy? Andy? No, it wasn't. It wasn't Stu, the guy that fell into the vat of acid? <laughs> Was it Matthew? Matthew. And he... And he was climbing. It wasn't a foreign name. Uh, that sort of sounded like an English thing. Pierre. He just pissed into the wind. Meanwhile, the war on terror was getting more terrifying. If you met a foreigner, you'd pretty much assume that he was going to kill you. And that had a big effect on things like the World Cup, much less kind of emphasis on this is a festival of football, much more emphasis on we'll probably all die here, let's hope to get out of this alive. Despite best efforts, undercover terrorists were still breaching security. When he came on, there was something in his eye, I knew there was something funny, and I turned to Porsche and I said, he's going to blow himself up. And he did. Now, here's the man who brings the two halves together, Dale Winter. <laughs> Meanwhile, the entertainer Vic Reeves was arrested for smuggling enriched uranium from Kurdistan. Britain went paranoid as more home secretaries came up with legislation to stop terror. We arrested Scary Spice. We also arrested someone called Terry. There'd be strip searches at things like the cinema and the the ballet. So people got used to just walking around with nothing on because they knew that it was the only way you could tell someone was definitely not a terrorist. And there was more criticism of the police when they shot a completely naked man because they thought he looked like a van packed with explosives. His family came over all together for the funeral, but unfortunately they came by coach. When the coach drew up, the policeman thought it was a rucksack. So he blew it up in a controlled explosion. He knows now he did wrong. The next day, 19 of Gordon Brown's home secretaries resigned. Are we over scared? I'd say we're... we're over scared. Oh, sorry, you just I said that. I just said that? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So what we did in the end, we placed a ban on people being terrified. How did you...? Well, we got the police to kind of put on beards and put in suspicious packages on buses and tubes and see if anyone was terrified and arrest them. Then we extended it to the cinema. We had agents go in to watch um, horror films and arrest anyone who looked terrified. And they arrested a whole number of people on Final Destination 3. Um, but we couldn't make it stick. I mean, I think the fault with that was that Final Destination 3 wasn't really scary enough. I mean, the problem to me was the title. How can you have a sequel of a film when you have finality embedded in the central concept and indeed in the title? To my mind, when Final Destination 2 was released, the original Final Destination should have been renamed Penultimate Destination. Anyway, that's beside the point. I mean, the thing was, it wasn't scary enough, so we couldn't make the charges stick. Ironically, it was because no news was now being broadcast that the war against terror was finally won. Since no atrocities were being reported, people were no longer terrified. By the end of it, it was almost... You sort of almost liked the terrorists. You might see one in a public library or something and you'd have a bit of band, you know, what are you reading? And you'd go, oh, that's, oh, it's a terror, it's a jihad uh, notebook or something. It was, it was fun, you know, it was kind of fun. And with the war on terror won, it was time to celebrate. And so to our first award, 
And terrorism can be a lonely business and a long, hard struggle. Our three finalists in this category are... Landmine destroyed a Russia bus in Tel Aviv's main street, Dizengoff. <laughs> the attempted attack in London. The BBC soon apologised for this show and shut down for a week. Now, please welcome Heather Mills. I mean, we've now had terror for 30 mm. years. How do you think that's affected us? Well, it solved the obesity problem because, you know, people were shitting themselves eight or nine times a day and that actually helped for a lot of people. Maybe just for the pre-watershed market. Yeah. We should say something instead of shit. Oh, OK, yeah. Crap themselves, shat themselves, okay. defecated, emptied themselves. They, yeah, well, it's so... Evacuated themselves. It's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'll go for that one. OK. <clears throat> I suppose the main thing was it, it solved the obesity problem because, you know, people evacuated their bowels about eight or nine times a day. <laughs> really? Yeah. 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 Didn't know that. Here's Graham with a quick incision. Cut through. The liver. There we go. Oh. There we are. Can we take that back? I'll make some um, reference to the liver and obviously this. Um, Silla being from Liverpool. Imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger. A brotherhood of man. Imagine all people. We had a big party in Trafalgar Square to celebrate the end of the war on terror. Unfortunately, a bomb went off and um, a lot of people were killed. The next day, we declared war on terror again, but um, this time we decided we, we wouldn't have a party at the end. Next week on Time Trumpet, we catch up with an increasingly mad Tom Cruise. Do you think I have lifts in my shoes? Prove to me that I have lifts in my shoes. You can't, because you don't have my shoes. Rape an ape. The most popular program television ever made. Rape an ape. We look at decline in respect for the royal family. You know, you'd see Prince Charles on the bus with people just flicking his ears, saying, what are you going to do about it? And we remember the war between Denmark and Tesco's.